Hello, everybody, and welcome back for another week of Principles of Marketing. Um, this week, we are moving on to Part B of the Product P. We spent a little bit of time last week talking about the Product P. Um, so this is Chapter 12, the second segment of the Product P. Um, a lot like last week, we do have a lot of information squeezed into such a small chapter. So um, this PowerPoint is actually 120 slides, and I, I do encourage you to read it in its entirety. I also encourage you to read the textbook in its entirety as well. But um, for the purposes of this video lecture, I'm going to hit the highlights uh, and hit the important things that you need to know for your quiz this week, as well as for your discussion board assignment this week. So uh, as we move through these, uh, we're going to be talking about innovation this week, um, specifically um, the diffusion of innovation theory and also the product life cycle. Um, and when you think about someone who is very innovative or a company that's very innovative, uh, you think about new things, right? New things that are coming out. They're always designing new things. They're always, they always have great ideas. They're innovative. Um, so keeping that framework in mind, we're going to move forward, continuing with our thoughts of what it means to be an innovator. Um, and I'm going to ask you the question of, why do firms even bother with creating new products? What's the point? Why do we want these new products? Um, and there's a lot of different reasons, but um, it, surprisingly, entirely new to the world products or new to the market products only represent um, a little less than 10% of all new product introductions every year, which is pretty surprising. Um, but and, and you'll understand why in just a moment, but really the reason why here is Rather than creating a brand new product, lots of companies tend to reposition a current product, changing just a few little things and, and repositioning their product. So it's better to think about newness in the sense of marketing as a continuum rather than a totally uh, brand new, new to the world, has to be something spectacular and brand new all the time. Okay, um, so... Regardless of what type of product you're talking about or what type of company, innovation is really important because without innovation and its resulting new products, we only see a lot of things. Firms would either have to continue marketing their same old product over and over and over again to their same old consumers, never really growing, maybe losing a customer here and there, um, or their other option would be to take their current product and market it um, somewhere differently in a different market with similar consumers. So um, only a few options there. Um, again, here when we're talking about innovation, your book defines this as the process by which ideas are transformed into new offerings. Uh, and that does include product, services, processes, etc. Okay, so going back to our question about why firms create new products or specifically why firms have to innovate, you have this nice little graphic that helps to display this for you. And you'll learn this semester that I absolutely love these graphics and that you um, will see a lot of these this semester. So um, there's some various reasons here as to why firms do innovate and why they do create new products. Um, so with number one, uh, the, the primary reason is that consumers needs change, right? We get bored. We, we get tired of buying the same old thing over and over again. Um, new things come out, new products. We want to um, have value. We want to have our needs met um, and our, our needs change. So the primary reason here um, as to why firms create new products is to you know continue satiating consumers' needs, to continue making consumers happy. Um, some good examples of this, when you think about... Um, going out to, uh, let's say you're going to somewhere for the weekend, maybe you're going to Asheville, North Carolina, and you want to stop at the Scenic Overlook and take pictures. You probably don't think about going to purchase a disposable camera anymore. Uh, you also probably don't think about needing even maybe a digital camera because we all have our phones, right? We all have these great uh, cameras on our phones. That's what we're going to use. Um, and cell phone companies decided to, to market to that. They said, oh, well, why do you need to carry around a digital camera, an MP3 player, an iPod, and a flip phone, right? Why don't we just give you an iPhone that has all of these? Um, another example here, uh, when you think about people using a cane, you maybe picture a little woman or a little old man, and they're kind of bent over. They have a hunchback from, from using that little cane so often. So um, some companies have made these ski pole canes that actually work to... 
uh, make you have good posture while also satisfying your needs. So you don't have to be a hunchback and you still have some help getting around. So consumers needs change, okay? Um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is market saturation. Um, and typically, the longer a product exists in the market, the more likely it is that product is eventually gonna become saturated. Um, so one thing that marketers do to kind of get around this is um, repositioning products. And we talked about this just a little bit, um, but very, very few people drive the exact same car over and over and over again for years and years and years, unless you're me. Um, okay, and you'll, you'll, I'll tell you more about my car here in some, some slides later. But um, usually people will, maybe you find a certain car you like, like maybe you get a Toyota 4Runner and uh, you just love it. So every year they bring out a new Toyota 4Runner. It has more bells and whistles. It has different things. And people, maybe, you know, their car's not dying. They're not driving it till the wheels fall off. Maybe they just want to upgrade because of all these new bells and whistles, okay? So a lot of firms sustain their growth each year uh, really just by getting these customers excited about these new features, these uh, bells and whistles, if you will. Okay, and they're trying to get them to exchange their vehicle well before the vehicle's functional life has ended. So this is just an example of how a market can become saturated. If they only sold the 1994 Toyota 4Runner today, um, they probably wouldn't be very successful, right? So they have to continue innovating each year with different products. Um, so I have an example for you here, um, a Toyota Highlander. This is the vehicle that I drive. Um, and you can see like the 2013 model here on the left that I have, and then you can see uh, the new one, I believe this might be the 17, um, and, and they're different body styles. There's all these new bells and whistles inside. Uh, my aunt has the newer one, and I'm always giving her a hard time. Oh, it's so nice. I love it. I want one. You know, they change little things. And so even though we may not need a new vehicle, sometimes people tend to upgrade unless you're me and you're cheap, and then you're going to drive it until it has like 400,000 miles and absolutely will not go one more mile. Uh, but that's another point. So we talked about changing consumer needs. We talked about market saturation. Let's talk about managing risk through diversity. Um, and this is exactly what it sounds like. Think about like stocks if you're trying to manage your business portfolio. Like um, you, you may not want to put all your eggs in one basket, right? Because if that one product uh, doesn't do well, then your whole company is going to tank kind of thing. So it's the same thing here. Um, with marketers when we do innovation, um, we often create a portfolio of products just like you might have a portfolio of investments. Um, and this helps us kind of diversify our risk and provide value to consumers uh, in, a, in a way that a single product cannot. So an example here is Keebler. Uh, they're actually the company that makes vanilla wafers. So I, I have a funny little slogan up here. You know, if, if the vanilla wafers tank, they're not going down. It's, uh, you know, if, if people stop buying vanilla wafers, well, they have all these other awesome products. Uh, I personally have never seen these cheesecake middles, but I'm going to look for them this week at the grocery store because those sound pretty good. Okay. But the point here in saying this is um, if one product, if the fudge strips don't sell well and they're losing money on those, maybe uh, these awesome little cheesecake middles are going to sell really well and it's going to balance out. So they can uh, sort of diversify their portfolio of products uh, by continually bringing new products by innovating. Um, fashion is another reason that people um, are continually innovating in companies. Um, usually movies, books, all these things uh, tend to sell within one year of its release date. So um, you, it's, it's popular. It's the fashionable, the hip, trendy thing to do, right? Um, there's a point on here about books as well. Um, if Books A Million only sold the same books they've had for 50 years, there really be no reason to keep buying more um, if there were no new titles, nothing new coming out. So we want to keep new things coming out to generate interest. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, one thing that a lot of people do here will re they'll remarket a familiar title to generate interest. It's so like Scooby Doo is well known for this. Um, you know they've had tons of new Scooby Doo movies and different things that and they change the actors or change what Scooby looks like, right? Um, Call of Duty may add a different game that's slightly different with a new topic. Um, and the last thing is just improving business relationships. Um, this sounds really silly, but 
Um, the grocery stores, whenever they were receiving craft lemonade, it wasn't selling very well just because of the, the way the product was shaped, the way it looked. It always made its way to like the bottom of the palette. It wasn't convenient. When it was on the shelves, it would fall over. So they created these like chimney style lemonades, and I, I don't have a picture of that, unfortunately. But um, they created these little, you've probably seen them, the, the Country Time chimney style lemonades, right? They changed their packaging uh, from a traditional like Kool-Aid style packet into this more um, chimney styled um, shape so that it would be easier for the grocery stores to place them on the shelves. They could have better shelf space. It was easier for them to put it uh, in their stores and they increased their sales by 162%. So uh, innovation is important. You need to see what your customers want, what your uh, business partners need and making sure that you meet those needs. So it's very important. Um, so these are just some reasons as to why firms do innovate. Um, and we're going to talk next. This is actually the topic of your discussion board. So make sure you, you really pay attention here to this part. Um, and okay, now we've innovated. That's great. What's next, right? Um, we're going to talk about some, some different steps of innovation and what Everett Rogers calls the diffusion of innovation theory, which will be super intriguing to you. I think you're really going to like this. So um, the point in saying all this is that this innovation, everybody thinks, oh, a new product comes out and the next day people are sold out. Well, yes and no. It doesn't exactly work like that. Okay, It doesn't always happen. Uh, people don't adopt products at the same time. It doesn't usually happen overnight. It's a long methodical process and there is um, actually some, some theory behind it, some marketing theory that drives how this works. So um, we're going to talk about Everett Rogers Diffusion of Innovation Theory um, and this just talks about how essentially and, and how quickly a product spreads throughout a market group over time and through these different categories of adopters. Um, there are five specific categories of adopters that we're going to be looking at. Um, and before we get there, I just want to give you a few general um, kind of vocabulary words from your chapter that will help kind of put this into perspective. But when you think about a brand new product, totally new to the world, no one has ever, ever, ever heard of it before. Um, these products are what we refer to in the marketing world as pioneers or breakthroughs. Um, and they essentially establish these totally new markets and, and change the rules for competition and consumer preferences because they're a brand new product no one has ever done this before, right? It's a breakthrough. So think about the iPod when it first came out. Um, you know, people were still carrying around CD players. No one had ever thought of an iPod and this uh, this store online where you could go and buy music, right? We were all still using LimeWire and downloading things illegally, right? Um, so the iPod is great because um, you know it, it led the way to lots of future products. So we have iTunes now which eventually led to like the iPod Touch and the iPad, the iHome, so you could listen to your music at home, and of course now the iPhone. Uh, we also needed cases for these, docking stations, speakers, Bluetooth speakers, earbuds. Okay, um, this, the first movers or the pioneers, the breakthroughs are, are always important for this kind of thing. Um, like I said, they are the first movers. And typically, um, they've been shown to command a greater market share over a longer period of time than those later entrants. However, there is also a second mover advantage, okay? Um, so, and the reason being, whenever these first movers, these pioneers, whenever they bring their products, a lot of times they have a less sophisticated design, and a lot of times they're priced a little higher than, say, later products. So, um, you know, one company may come up with the iPhone, and then someone else comes up with a cheaper version, like Samsung, and you know, they have a, they have a cheaper version of a phone that still does similar features. Uh, it, it's not priced as expensively, and it you know they can change it and, and improve the features, and it may sell just as well. Okay, so second mover advantage is something to think about as well um, when you're marketing your products. Um, now, a lot of people always ask me, well, Mr. Harrison, you know, why did these products fail? What what why does this happen? And to be honest, a lot of times um, it may just be that the company maybe didn't assess the market properly properly, or they're marketing to the wrong segment, they didn't do enough testing, they're not positioning their product well. But typically, the, the biggest red flag that I've seen, and then I'm going to show you some examples here in a second, the, the biggest red flag is when a company tries to 
overextend their competencies. And what I mean by that is um, if you're a company like BIC and you sell pens, um, you don't want to venture into a totally different product or totally different service that's totally inconsistent with your brand or your value proposition that we talked about earlier this semester. So an example, um, BIC usually sells pens, right? But they started selling underwear. It was totally, um, completely out from what they are normally selling. Totally uh, just a terrible idea, right? Uh, Colgate, who normally sells toothpaste, they got into like this frozen food, um, lunch food kind of business, and they were selling beef lasagna. And it was just, you know, we know Colgate as a toothpaste company. We know BIC as a pen and pencil company, not as underwear and um, frozen lunches, okay? Um, obviously, the name choice in these two photos was not great either. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, some, And again, sometimes it's just venturing out a little too far. So Jimmy Dean is known for their breakfast foods. Well, why not, you know, uh, create a corn dog style uh, pancakes and sausage on a stick because everybody wants to put blueberry pancakes with sausage, right? And eat it all together. Or maybe if you want a um, warm beverage, you're going to drink some urinal, um, as the name of the product goes. Okay, so I think you can see why some of these are just not great um, for the simple purpose of their naming, number one. And number two, just because these companies are kind of venturing a little too far away from um, really what their company stands for and what they should be doing. Okay, so... As we look at this, this, this is all to say that the diffusion of innovation theory can help guide you to see uh, maybe where your product is falling, um, what it's going to do over the next few years. You can kind of see where it falls over a period of time. And there is um, some degree of, of science to this, okay? But uh, there are five groups, and we're going to look at each of these. They do follow a bell-shaped curve. So if you're a stats person, you're going to appreciate this. If you're not a stats person, um, don't. Don't put me on pause just yet. Um, you don't have to know too much math. Don't worry. Um, this is what the diffusion of innovation curve looks like. Um, and just like with stats, you can see with your bell curve, you have around 68% that falls here in the middle, 2.5% here, so and so on and so forth. So as we look at these, um, innovators are typically the people who are the first ones to buy a product. That's why we call them the innovators, right? They go first. Uh, typically, they are risk takers, and they're usually highly knowledgeable in their field. Um, these innovators are absolutely crucial to new products and new services because they they really ha help the product gain market acceptance, okay? An example is that guy who stands in line absolutely all night to get the very first ticket for a showing of this newest uh, maybe Avengers movie because he is just obsessed with the Avengers ride. He's seen every one of them. It's coming out tomorrow. He is going to be camping out outside waiting to get the ticket. Okay, um, or maybe it's the person who on Black Friday absolutely knows that they want the brand new iPhone and it's coming out the day before. Oh my gosh, let's go to Verizon and camp out outside. Okay, um, so you can see a picture of that here. Remember, these innovators do only make up around 2.5% of the total market, okay? But, again, these people do have a lot of um, clout behind their name. They usually are regarded as being highly knowledgeable. Uh, they probably subscribe to some kind of trade or specialty magazine. They're talking to other experts. They read blogs about the product. Okay, they're very uh, into it. So you can see those innovators over here with only 2.5%. Um, our next group is the early adopters, and they don't adopt immediately, and they're not as big of risk takers, but they do kind of get out there pretty quickly. Um, they wait and purchase after careful review. They listen to what the innovators did. Did they like the product? Did they not? And then they go buy it within those first few weeks, okay? So they, they do read some reviews. They go a week or two after the movie opens, um, listen for those complaints and praises. They typically um, also are regarded as being opinion leaders in their product categories, okay? So they didn't go and buy the Samsung Curve TV the first night it came out. They waited a few weeks, read some blogs, went back and got it. Um, these early adopters are important, though, and they do represent around 13.5% of the market. Uh, they, they spread the word, which is super important. Um, 
another reason why these people are important is they they do help bring the other three buyer categories that we're going to talk about next. They help kind of move them along. And even though this group is still relatively small, um, it, it, they do a great job in terms of spreading the word for other people. So, so we've talked about these innovators, these early adopters. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the early majority. Okay, this is where you get 34% of the population, so a larger portion. Um, and this is one of the more important groups here because until this group actually purchases the product, uh, very, very few products and very, very few services can actually become profitable. They need this large group of people to actually um, make the plunge. And of course, without the innovators and the early adopters coming along first, the early majority doesn't have a chance to get there. So it's um, also dependent on what those other two groups have done. So, uh, but again, if this group does not purchase, if the early majority never gets on board, they never get on the bandwagon, usually the product or service will fail. Okay, so this is a good indicator if your product is in this stage and um, the early majority has not yet latched on, your product is probably going to fail, generally speaking. Okay, um, this early majority, they do usually wait for the bugs to be worked out. They're reading all these reviews. They're making sure they know what they're getting. They're not the risk takers, generally speaking. Um, so maybe instead of seeing the new Star Wars movie in theaters, they wait for it to come out on Netflix or on DVD to watch it. Uh, they usually look for lower cost, um, and they usually have lots of choices because, um, and, and lots of alternatives because the price is usually going down by this point. They have other people offering the same product, so they can go buy the product at Best Buy or buy it at Walmart or buy it at Target and shop around on prices. So. Lots to consider. So we're, we're getting there. We've gotten a large portion of the market now. Uh, of course, the late majority hops on the bandwagon after these, uh, the early majority here. They hop on the bandwagon next. They are, again, 34%, just like before. Um, generally, by the time this group hops on the bandwagon, the product has started to achieve its full potential, and usually sales are starting to either level off or maybe they're even declining by now. Okay, and then last, we have our final category, the laggards. Um, and I always joke about my grandparents being laggards. Um, they are the people who still have flip phones and an iPhone generation. Okay, they're absolutely not going to get a new product until they absolutely have no other choice, until flip phones are no longer sold anywhere ever again. They will always have one. They're never going to upgrade until they absolutely have to. Um, they love to rely on those traditional products. These are your laggards. They hate change, they make up only 16% of the market. Um, so those are the areas of the diffusion of innovation curve that you're gonna be writing about this week in your discussion board. And I do want you to mention all of those areas. Um, I'm also gonna ask you to mention some factors that kind of expedite or speed up this diffusion of innovation process. Uh, there are five factors here we're really gonna talk about. Starting with relative advantage, um, Think about what it means if your product has an advantage. It's exactly what you think. Um, so if your product or service is better than substitutes, if it has an advantage over substitute products, its diffusion is going to happen pretty quickly. An example of this is Swiffer products. Okay, You can buy all kinds of cleaning and dusting products, but we've all heard about Swiffer um, because it their, their advertising and their marketing really emphasizes that they can make cleaning faster, more efficient, easier, um, and you know, old people who used to get on their hands and knees and dust and scrub, they have their maybe have to use a ladder to get up high. They have these awesome Swiffers with these extenders they can use to just get it done really quickly. And here's a picture of an old woman with using her Swiffer. She doesn't. She no longer has to get a ladder and get up there and take all those things down. And you know, she can just quickly Swiffer it. Um, another thing to think about is compatibility. Okay, um, so, and this is where you may have to actually change your product slightly depending on, uh, you know, who you're marketing to specifically or to whom you're marketing, I should say. Um, so, and this is where cultural differences often come into play. Um, the vacuum cleaner company Electrolux, they make vacuums all in different sizes, uh, but they, so for example, they have a US version, which is huge and clunky, and it's there um, to vacuum usually carpeted homes, get a lot of dirt, um, you know, deal with larger spaces. And there's a version that's used in a lot of Asian countries that is smaller, it's quiet, 
um, you know, because rather than a single family home, there might be a big, um, you know, apartment complex where people live with shared walls and you want to be quiet. It's also smaller because you have smaller spaces and less dust, less dirt. So uh, compatibility is important depending on um, who you're talking about specifically. Observability is also something that's important. Uh, this is where advertising really comes into play. Um, you want to see how those benefits for your product are used and you want to see them communicated easily. So uh, why on earth would anybody need to spend $400 on a blender? Well, stand by. You're going to see, based on this advertisement, exactly why um, that needs to happen. So take a moment and enjoy this short little video for me. Will it blend? That is the question. I love my new iPad. It does a ton of cool things. But will it blend? That is the question. Doesn't quite fit in the jar, but I can take care of that. I knew I could get the iPad in a Blend Tech Total Blender. I think I'll press the I Blend button. smoke. Don't breathe this. Ah, that was one tough pad. Okay, so obviously as facetious as this is intended to be, um, it does help do a good job of showing just exactly what observability is. Your consumers need to be able to see exactly what your product offers for them. Okay, so whether it's a golf ball, an iPad, or Justin Bieber's autobiography, this blender can blend it all, right? So it's worth spending your money on, maybe. Okay, um, the next thing, the, the next two factors that kind of accelerate the diffusion process are complexity and trialability. These are exactly what they sound like. The less complex that your product is and the easier it is to try it, um, the, the quicker it's gonna sell, the more likely people are to adopt it. Um, so a good example of this is Dyson. They have a lot of vacuum cleaners and um, you know, they offer in store all these displays at Bed Bath & Beyond where you can go in and actually try using the vacuum cleaner. Um, so sure, um, their vacuum cleaner may be tryable, um, but it's a little more complex. It's harder to buy a new vacuum than it is just to try a new cleaning spray. You know, you can pick up um, a new kind of uh, granite cleaner for $3 versus um, if you want to buy a new vacuum, you got to spend a couple hundred. So Different options, different different um, different points of view here. Complexity and trialability. Um, okay, so we've hopped through those, and I briefly just want to mention how firms develop new products. That is the title of this chapter, and again, we are in the product P, so this is important. Um, these are the steps that a company would go through in terms of creating a new product. We start with idea generation, where we have lots of different things we can do here. This is where you have research and development, you get consumer input, you look at competitors' products, we do some brainstorming, get licenses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this all happens in idea generation. Next, we move over to concept testing. Uh, this is where we do lots of different tests. We look to see, uh, we test our ideas that we had before in the idea generation stage and try to um, look at some options that would be best for our customers. Um, then, of course, we move into the product development stage. Once we've decided on one of our ideas, that's great. We develop a prototype um, and sort of move into market testing where we actually test the product. Uh, then, of course, we launch the product, commercialize it. And at the end, we meet, we evaluate our results, see how we did, see if it performed adequately, if customers were happy, et cetera, et cetera. Th these are the steps for developing a new product. 
I do want you to read through these. There are quite a few slides on these, but for now, uh, I'm going to skip through these just for the sake of time. But I do want you to actually go through um, and look at each of these things individually. Okay, one last thing that I want to talk to you about today before I let you go is the product life cycle. Now, be very careful not to confuse this with the diffusion of innovation theory. These are two very, very different things, although they do go hand in hand to some degree, and you're going to see why in a second. Don't confuse these. Okay, so your, your discussion board this week, you should be talking about the diffusion of innovation theory, not the product life cycle, although you can mention the product life cycle, but the focus of your discussion should be the diffusion of innovation theory. Okay, so um, as we go through these, I've already told you not to confuse it <laughs> with the diffusion of innovation, but typically the product life cycle helps us to visualize, it helps to define the stage that products move through as they enter, sort of get established in, and then leave the market, okay? Um, and usually they do reflect trends in the marketplace. Right now the big thing is having a healthy lifestyle, you know, green eating, organic products, and it helps those products be kind of in the growth stage right now because they're trendy, right? Um, so usually as a product first introduces and innovators start to buy the product, we would say it's in the introduction stage. Whereas once it's gained acceptance um, and demand for this product and sales start to increase, more competitors emerge, we said the product's in the growth stage at that point. Um, once sales kind of start to peak, um, and firms start to rejuvenate their products by adding new features or repositioning the products, we say that uh, the product is in the maturity stage. And then usually um, if the product succeeds, well, hey, great, it's um, achieved a new life, we just keep going. Or if not, if it doesn't succeed, we enter the decline stage and our product usually exit the market, exits the market. Um, so just to give you, this is a little more complicated than the diffusion of innovation theory because Products can stay in certain stages in the product life cycle forever. And a good example of this is home appliances. They usually stay in that maturity stage for a long time. Um, I, I just recently uh, started remodeling my kitchen. And for the first time in my entire life, I'm going to have a dishwasher. And I'm pretty stoked about that, to be honest with you. Uh, I've decided that um, you know a dishwasher is in the maturity stage here because... Until a new product comes along that is superior to the dishwasher, um, dishwashers are really unlikely to enter the decline stage. So they're probably not going to go out of the market mm -hmm. until something better comes along, like maids that will come to your house and wash your dishes for you that are very affordable, right? Um, joking, of course. Um, but typically these products, home appliances in general, do stay in the maturity stage, but uh, manufacturers change and update them every year. They may they might make a quieter dishwasher. They might add a stove that has convection bake, or you know, add some different little bells and whistles to the products so that they are, um, you know, able to continue to be marketed and purchased by consumers and stay in that maturity stage. Um, you may have heard um, that in order in business, in order to make money, you have to spend money or give money out. Uh, that is true, and that is why many products in the introduction stage um, usually start with losses, usually have some initial losses, you maybe have some really high startup cost, and you probably have a low level of sales initially. Uh, but towards the end of the introduction stage, if your product is doing well, you will start to see some profits towards the end of this stage. So again, you can kind of characterize where your product is based on all of these things. Um, innovators are usually the ones to try the product when it is in this introduction stage. Okay, so again, kind of see how it's slowly starting to make a profit. Um, in the growth stage, we see lots more people adopting the product. Um, you also see more increases in the competition, lots of alternative products available. This is where firms kind of try to look at what consumers prefer and they start to create a lot of product variations. Maybe it's a different style, some new features, different colors, whatever it might be. It helps them kind of segment the market a little more precisely. Okay, profits do usually rise here along with industry sales, which is great. And by this point, if firms haven't established a, a stronghold in any particular market, they, they tend to exit in what we call an industry shakeout. 
Um, so you can see the introduction of the growth stages here. Next, of course, we move to the maturity stage. This is where the late majority is tending to adopt the product. There's a lot of competition. Marketing costs increase because we're having to pay more for promotion and distribution to keep up with our competition. Uh, the price of the product itself usually tends to fall here uh, just because there is so much competition. And then, of course, we get to the decline stage where our laggards start to purchase the product if they um, haven't yet tried it. Um, and we see the decline stage here. Um, this is where a company may decide to target diehard consumers or people who are just really specifically, they need this product. Um, or if not, they may exit the market at this time. Okay, and this chart's great. It shows you with each um, stage of the product life cycle exactly where, oh, sorry, uh, exactly where those consumers are, whether it's an innovator, an early adopter, or a laggard, etc. It shows you um, in which stage you can expect these typical consumers. Helps to show you what to expect with your sales, what to expect with the competition. This is just a, a great chart to keep um, as a reference for your future in the business world. Um, okay, so this is everything that I really wanted to hit the highlights on for you this week. Please don't forget your discussion board. As always, if you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out anytime via email. And I'm happy to help. I will have your your um, marketing application responses from last week graded as soon as I can. And I hope everybody has a wonderful week. See you soon.